I think what got me involved is as a young kid watching black and white television and truly it was the original homicide, Jack Fagan, and they used to walk up the steps of uh, Russell Street with Leonard Teal and I thought, you know what, they can solve a crime in an hour. Uh, it's interesting, it's a jigsaw puzzle. I'd love to walk up those steps and then uh, 1980 was the first time I walked up those steps. I did bring the pork pie hat back in in 1995, but it didn't last. <laughs> You worked your way through various positions, then in 1980 started the Homicide Squad, working in St Kilda at the age of 28. 1983, heroin was the number one public enemy, now ICE obviously is. At 3 a.m. on one morning in 1984, you saw something suspicious. You pulled over the car, then you're confronted by one of the guys who grabbed your gun and you, um, a struggle ensued, and you got injured. And at that point in time, you expected to be killed. How do you pick yourself up, get on with the job, go back, and then you had to ring Colleen, your wife, and you said you've been a little bit um, hurt, and then she saw you battered and bruised. How does that go down with the family, knowing that each and every day, the police are confronted with these sorts of issues, not perhaps on the streets so much as, well, maybe they are these days with um, ice, but how do you go home and tell your wife, and your wife comes to the station to see you that morning? It just must have been such a scary thing for a young bloke at 28 thinking, my God, this is, this is the last, this is all there is. Uh, back then in 1983, um, you probably didn't tell your wife about those bad things. And it was close on three o'clock in the morning. There was a Holden parked uh, in a side street. There were three men in it. Uh, we went up to the side of the car. Uh, two ran off and it left me with uh, one. The next thing is he's got a sawn off um, 22. He's punched me. He's pushing me back over a, a fence and he's grabbed the butt of my gun. And it was just like looking down a tunnel. I was waiting for um, one almighty bang and I thought, that's it. Uh, and then the adrenaline kicked in. You either have fight or flight. And fight kicked in, thank goodness. And I was able to uh, overpower him. I ended up with um, bruises and stitches. And uh, the method then was uh, knock off at seven o'clock. I went to the London Tavern in Port Melbourne, drank four or five um, stubbies, drove home. And, <laughs> and then I rang my wife who was at work and not impressed because she wasn't the first person to know. So how do you come back from it? Actually, I went back the next, the next night, but I think the environment of policing now is more dangerous than it was then. We all have fight or flight. But the sad reality is for a police officer, when he's confronted with a difficult situation, his body might be telling him he should be in flight, but he's actually got to go in and fight and he can't move away. So we have now 35 members a month going off with a psychological injury, partly because we think we're tough and we're men and we don't talk about it. We've got to talk about those things just like prostate cancer. Now, Ron, um, you've had amazing success over the years and it's either 97% or 99% on who you believe and who you read, but you've gone through. Why was it the first investigation so difficult? Because that's the only murder along the way that was is still unsolved and must obviously get at you, but 97 to 99% homicide success rate is quite incredible. Oh, obviously, the first one I was inexperienced, but I worked with uh, experienced officers, and that was the murder of uh, Maria James. Uh, July 1980, she was stabbed 69 times uh, in a bookshop in Thornbury. You know, her ex-husband had um, worked at the Fitzroy Council. She made a phone call to him and she said something like, I'm in trouble, can you came up, come out? He drove out there. When he got out, the front door was locked. He went around to the back, was locked. He got a ladder and climbed through a window. But when he went to the bedroom, he saw her lying on the bedroom floor and there was blood everywhere. The killer was still standing behind the door, but he didn't know. When he went out and he came back in both the shop door, because it was a bookshop and the outside door was open. So she was reasonably secretive. Uh, she'd been uh, having an affair. Uh, we eliminated uh, a couple of uh, men who she'd been seeing. The priest opposite, Father Bongiorno, was somebody who had sexually assaulted her son, uh, Adam, and he became a suspect. And we've still tried for a long time to get um, his DNA or get him exhumed. But because that was the first one, you know, we put a lot of effort into it, I put a lot of effort into it, uh, but it's still unsolved and one of the things that I've always said is Faye is not an option. Mark, who was 14 at the time, still rings me and he's now um, nearly 50 
uh, and we still have a relationship and he's there's never going to be closure but they just look for answers. Now Ron in 1984 you spent time with the National Crime Authority which was a new organisation in Sydney. You worked with the original Mr Sin, Abe Saffron. A lot of you people probably don't know Abe Saffron but that's why you need to buy this book because um, in those early days as old people like myself, as John Beeks was referring to before, but old people like myself remember those King's Cross days with um, the sleazy nightclubs. I have been to a couple of them, I must admit. And um, all those sorts of places, just checking out the entertainment, of course, and looking to a disco. But to go to Sydney, where it was such in, um, ensconced crime up there, because it wasn't just Mr Big, Babe Saffron, because he had politicians, he had police, he had all sorts of other people on the payroll. But how do you go there, a young bloke from Melbourne, to try and break into an area which was new, the National Crime Authority. It must have been a real culture shock for you. It was a culture shock. Like, I had worked at St Kilda, but King's Cross in that area was totally different. Uh, I'd read a lot about Abe Saffron, and he was called uh, Mr Sin. He was a very wealthy man, uh, but he had uh, paid a lot of police. And I actually met someone called James McCartney Anderson, who was his right-hand man. Jimmy Anderson, yes. Who gave us a lot of information about how Abe Saffron uh, operated and he had two separate uh, books and in one book he would have payment to the Police Boys Club, which was a genuine club up there, a bit like the Scouts, but what that was was payment to the police. He was very well hooked up with Bob Hawke, he was very well hooked up with uh, Neville Rand. Um, so we were looking at him for taxation uh, fraud, but also the, the murder of Juanita Nielsen, who was um, a girl up there who... Uh, was against the development of a certain part of uh, King's Cross. And then we got involved in uh, things like um, Nettie Smith, uh, and it was corrupt, and we had to move probably every two weeks from the hotel we had. We, we'd had threats. We started to look at the Luna Park fires up there, which Abe Saffron was behind. He hired a bike called Tosha McSimby to burn the uh, Luna Park down, but what Tosha didn't realise is that there was still one ghost train coming and eight young kids burned to death. So. The ironic thing is eventually we charged him with um, some taxation fraud and I'm with uh, my partner and we were down at Crown Street where Abe had a, um, his office but he had this big cellar downstairs that was like a, a big vault and we wanted to search it and we're inside there and Abe standing at the door just smiling and I said, Abe, don't shut the door because if he shut the door, I wouldn't be here today. We'd still be down there. But he was a lot. He was likable, but he was uh, he was corrupt and very strong in the business world, and that's how he made his money. Yep. Then you return to Victoria, um, where the police brotherhood people like Dennis Tanner. We've read a lot about Dennis. In fact, his brother was selling um, new houses in Bendigo for a steel construction firm. So Dennis was pretty notorious. Now you're up against those sort of um, people. You being a good cop, um, not because the book says so, but you, when you read it all, you understand and. Um, we know that you are a good cop, but how do you come back to Victoria looking and working in that environment where you know, and obviously that was part of the reason when you went for the police association job, that some people didn't want a good cop to be running the police association, but that'll come later. But how do you come back and with that brotherhood, it's so difficult when you're trying to achieve something, get the numbers up and... Um, uh, fix crime in this society, but that wasn't happening when you had the brotherhood against you. You know, there's no doubt if you go back to uh, the 70s, there was corruption in Victoria Police, there was corruption in New South Wales, but it was systemic. Uh, you worked in um, St Kilda, and there are six members who I work with at St Kilda who are either now in jail or have been in jail. So that whole area there was, um, I won't say everyone was corrupt, but there was about taking money from prostitutes, there was a uh, drug trafficking accepting uh, bribes, so there was a new group of sergeants who tried to actually change it. But it's about looking at yourself, never compromising your own integrity, and always the decisions you've made have to be based against your values. But we had the back of the police station burnt to the ground, and there's absolutely no doubt it was burnt to the ground uh, by police. We had a senior sergeant's car torched in the car park. This was because we started to change the culture and we're still getting there now. We don't have systemic corruption, uh, but we still have pockets of it uh, around, but it's individual, not um, sort of down a long uh, line that's been passed down. So it's difficult, but I think um, we're 
far better place than we were back in the 70s and 80s. Okay. Now, over the years, you've befriended some pretty bad criminals, I suppose I'll say, um, including Chopper Reed. And I know that towards Chopper Reed's um, life end, it was basically you spent a lot of time with Chopper and um, he confronted and he confounded lots of the issues that were sort of happening over the years and you became sort of friends. You can't go overboard and be real friendly. I understand Carl Williams was just to name a few of these people. Because over the years, you've kept in touch with a lot of people um, that have been had some ter terrible things happen in their life, murders and so on. Um, cases like Michelle Buckingham, um, who was murdered, but her mum, Elvira, did not believe the right man was convicted. How do you go home of a night time and think about these sort of things? The people, the knowledge that you have, and as we saw with Carl Williams, um, what eventually happened in the jail. Um, how do you go home and think about these things? Because in, as you mentioned earlier, um, they didn't have mechanisms where you could turn off to this stuff. You just had to go back the next day. And then all of a sudden, you've got to be confronted with these sorts of people. But how do you turn off and, and how do you feel when you know that perhaps someone like Elvira, um, she knew that the wrong person was convicted? How do you feel with that sort of stuff? Um, we go back to say, um, Chopper, I've always had a view that you keep the line of communications open. You treat criminals just the same as you treat anyone else and you treat them with um, uh, respect. You never breach your trust, you never backflip them and as a result of that uh, they'll always come and they'll, they'll talk to you. So I charged in 1981 a bloke called uh, Bruce Nichols, and he got sentenced to life. He ultimately did 25 years and he got out and the first week he got out he rang me and I went and had a cup of coffee with him. He said, Ron, I did the wrong thing. I've done my time. Can I actually work for you? And he wanted to work as an undercover um, with me, even though he'd done 25 years. <laughs> but one morning he rang me at two o'clock in the morning and he said, I want, I want to tell you something. There is a lady who is dead in a flat in Footscray. Her 18-month-old baby boy is there and the boy hasn't been fed for about three days. He said, I'll tell you what's happened. It's a drug overdose. I'm with the girl's partner, there's a family intervention order, everyone's going to think he, that he killed her. So he said, send the police around, which I did, and sure enough, she was dead, but the 18 month old was there. So it's about, he had the confidence to pick up the phone. So another one is um, a Glenn Heaton, he's mentioned in the book, Glenn Heaton shot a uh, security guard at the Lower Plenty Hotel in 1996, a bloke called Alexander McGaffin. He got a smart lawyer and he actually beat it and was acquitted. And he walked out, but I shook his hand and I said, Glenn, you've just had the biggest break in your life, now get on and uh, move on. Six years ago he rang me, he said, do you know who this is? It's Glenn. No, Glenn. Yeah, it's Glenn Heaton. I want to meet you. And I went and had a coffee with him. He said, I had a smart lawyer. I got off. I shouldn't have got off. I've absolutely ruined my life. I would have been better off going to jail, serving 20 years and coming out. I then arranged a house for him through the Department of Human um, Services and he's in regular contact and he rings me for advice. He'll never make a statement to say that he killed um, Alexander McGaffin because of um, double jeopardy. But if you read what he says in the book, if it wasn't for me, he would have gone on and killed again. So it's about having the connection with those people. How do I go home? How do I sleep? If it's a current job that you're doing, and you're out and you've been going for 24, 40 hours, you don't sleep very well. I always used to write down all the things that I'm thinking about that I have to do when I wake up. But then eventually you've got to learn to cut off. Um, but as I said, I've never, I've never not switched my phone off. So another bloke, Lenny Ryan, killed um, uh, a security guard at Blackburn in um, 2005 and we'd been looking for him. He was a professional arm robber. He rang me at two o'clock in the morning. He says, I want to give myself up. I said, no worries, come and give yourself up. He says, no, not until I go and see my girlfriend for one more time. He, he said, well, why not? <laughs> you do. He said, uh, are you following me? I said, no, I'm home in bed. So he said, all right. So he rings me back. He said, are you sure you're not following me? I said, no, but just come in at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, which he did. But I drove coaches for 15 years uh, to Adelaide and Sydney overnight. So I was supposed to go to Adelaide that night and I rang up Joe Bono who owned Firefly. I said, Joe, I can't go tonight. He goes, why? 
I said, I've been up all night talking to this crook. He's coming in and I've got to interview him. She said, all right, I'll get, you, I'll get another driver. So he rings me back about 12. He said, I can't find a driver. Rod Hartley's who's here, refused to drive for him. So he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go with you. I'll drive to nil. You can sleep for four hours in the front seat. I'll jump in the coach that's coming from Adelaide and then I'll go back and you'll be right. So I said, all right. So Lenny Ryan rocks in at four o'clock. I just finished interviewing, charging with murder. Joe rings me, he says, I'm not going with you. I said, you got it. He says, I can't, I've got a toothache. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you what I've done for you though. The coach is parked around the back of the police station at the back of the homicide squad office. So I had a shower at seven o'clock. I got in the coach and I made it to Adelaide. I don't know how, but I did. So, but it is about having that connection. When a crook rings you, if you don't answer the phone, that might be the only time that they've got the confidence to ring you and you miss it. So it's just about building that relationship. Ron, moving on from that one, which has been your most challenging case? Because I know there's plenty. Is there one that stands out in your mind that you think back and think, oh my God, we'll come to the Jill Maher one shortly, but um, is there anyone else that sort of stands in your mind from looking back at that amazing career of yours? Oh, I think, um there's been many that have been long and uh, difficult, I suppose. Uh, but the one who probably stands out is the disappearance of Elizabeth Memory in um, December 1994. Um, I took that over. I worked on it for 13 years and eventually charged um, Shane Bond. Um, we were confident that we would get a conviction, uh, but we didn't, and uh, he, he walked away. But that was 12 years of, uh, of work on one particular case. Not every day, but probably as we walk, move towards the end, it was constant for two years. And I had Roger and Joy ring me every Tuesday for 15 years. What are you doing? Why haven't you sold my daughter's job? Now, I didn't see it last night, but apparently they're on current affair last night because it's coming up to the 21st anniversary. And what they want is the, her remains. There is absolutely no doubt Shane Bond was responsible, but we didn't get to the point of beyond reasonable doubt. Okay, as I said, fast forward to um, Jill Ma, and it was on the 15th of November 2013, the bloke's biggest lunch, that um, Ron spoke and many of you were there that day. And then what subsequently followed, of course, was really out there, and um, all hell let loose. And as I said, um, Ron and I created a bond, a friendship from that, because I was in Melbourne with John, and um, we were having a prostate cancer Foundation meeting in Melbourne and I was having breakfast with my daughter and then Channel 9 rang, said Costello, um, Channel 7 rang, Channel 10 rang, um, 3AW, ABC and I was out the front of the um, MCG fielding questions about what the bloke's lunch was. I'll never forget Channel 9, um, I won't mention his name but I, every time I almost spit at the television when I see him because he made the comment to me um, is this what you call entertainment, having a bloke um, show dead bodies, which was nothing like that. If anyone deduced from that event that was about dead bodies, they are totally so wrong, and all you guys that were here can attest to that. But what had happened, of course, it was um, one small snippet, half a second, there was a photo, which I didn't even see. But there were so many other photos, but the message came through loud and clear, look after your mates, because there's consequence if you don't. Ask, are you okay? And that's what the message was trying to give. This dickhead from Channel 9 wouldn't listen. But anyway, moving on from that, Ron, um, sorry? No. Yeah, go on, it's not Channel 7, go on, say it. <laughs> no, it's not Channel 7. Channel 7 were very honourable. Anyway, um, the adverse publicity that followed, the next day, the Herald Sun, um, front page news, Neil Mitchell got stuck into you, the Premier, Nat Pine got stuck into you, ministers, all sorts of people, and you were denigrated for what you supposedly did at that bloke's lunch in 2013. How did you feel after so many years of dedication and service to the community, having been involved in 300 homicides, to have people putting you down like they did that particular day? That was a pretty uh, tough day, um, and a lot of people didn't know what had actually happened, and I always say ABC, assume nothing, believe nothing, check everything. If the reporters had have done that, if they had had the courtesy to ring me, they would have actually found out. Even Victoria Police, to some extent, um, threw me under the bus. Instead of saying, um, 
because they didn't check. I actually had permission um, from George and Edith, um, Jill's parents, and I had permission from Tom, and they knew what I was doing and they knew what the message was. Uh, but I was in I was in Brisbane and it was my last um, case because I was Michelle Buckingham and I just interviewed um, Stephen Bradley and I got the phone call to say oh there's going to be this article on the front page of the Herald Sun tomorrow about the photograph. Um, I rang the assistant commissioner, had a conversation with him, and he said we'll say that you're a great bloke. I said Steve, that's not the issue. The issue is we shouldn't be running this story. But the two reporters wanted to run the story. Uh, I didn't sleep. I got up at about three o'clock in the morning and I walked over the Brisbane River and I was on the bridge and then it had a sign there, if you're contemplating suicide, ring Lifeline. <laughs> I took a photograph of it because I thought it was pretty ironic. But then at that time was door stopped and he called me a disgrace. Neil Mitchell got up and said, um, what a disgrace. But to Neil Mitchell's credit, the following morning, over 300 people had um, emailed or rung him to say, hang on a minute, Neil, you got it wrong. So I want to thank you as a group and community for your support, but also uh, for uh, Keith's support. The ironic thing this week is I opened up the Herald Sun yesterday, I think it was. There's a two-page spread on the murder of uh, Pasco Barbero in Sydney, and there is a photograph of his body lying in the street, far worse than what I showed. At least I had permission from the family. I had uh, done it in a different context and I warned you when I opened up the Herald Sun, so I sent the journalist an email, I'm not bitter or twisted, <laughs> saying double standards. But look, it did knock me around, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and uh, you know, I've moved on from it. And I think a lot of people in the community realised that I, I was badly treated. You were badly treated, and all I was ever trying to do was make good out of bad. Yep. Chapter 25, No Looking Back. Christmas Eve 2013, you were toiling away, looking forward to the end of the day. We have a glass of your favourite, Barossa Valley Shiraz, with your wife, Colleen. You got a call from the superintendent to catch up with him at one o'clock that day for a meeting. And as you said in the book, it wasn't for a kiss under the mistletoe. <laughs> Your superintendent asked you, where in the police would you like to work? Only to be told that you were going to be moved on for your own welfare. He mentioned, we can't give you back to your family a broken man. You said at that particular time that if you get the police association job in March, the rest will be history. But how did you feel after 25 years of giving your all for the Homicide Squad to have that um, superintendent say that to you? Obviously he had your well-being at heart. Um, he knew the amazing job that you had done over that period. But how did you really feel that, um, and it was sort of soon after these events, but how did you really feel? What I felt was that number one is don't do it on Christmas Eve. Number two is be honest, don't spin me bullshit. That was never about my welfare. This was about, there used to be five of us at the office. Charlie Bazina, Lou Travers, Jeff Mark. I was the last one, I was the last man standing. So eventually I knew my time would come. I would have rather that conversation being, Ron, you've done 25 years, you've given magnificent service. We're actually changing our model and we want new blood in here. We'll transition you out over the next 12 months. Because if it was about my welfare, I worked the next day, which was Christmas Day, Boxing Day, I was here in Bendigo. There was a body burned out in a car out here, uh, an ice dealer, and I spent the next three days here in Bendigo working 18 hours a day. Did I get a phone call about my welfare? No, it was never about my welfare. I think the Jill Ma thing was the catalyst in the end. People thought I had a higher profile than many other people in the, in the police force. I never set out to have a profile. I just did a lot of big jobs, which created a lot of media. So in the end, I said, I was offered any job that I would want in the crime department, and I said, no, I've been asked to put in for the role of the secretary of the police station. If I get it, then I'll move on. They said, well, we'll give you the biggest send off that you've ever had. I said, I don't want one. When I walk out of here, I'll close the door and I won't be back, and I haven't been back since. That moves me on to a couple of other points. You've already mentioned about how your relaxation was driving buses. I can't understand that at all. <laughs> And I understand you, at one stage, you left the um, police force 
and um, had your own furniture removal business and Arthur was one of the drivers or people involved. Hi Arthur. Arthur owned a shop but he never helped me unload. No, of course not. <laughs> It's always a bit strong, guys. That's why we're sitting down because I didn't want to be standing up next to Ron doing this interview. But how how did you sort of you mentioned before how that was a sort of a turn off? But how, I don't I quite get that. But you left the police force and then you came back because you really missed it. But how was um, furniture um, removal? How was that going to sort of satisfy your curiosity after all the years you'd had in the homicide squad? I think what happened is after 17 years, I probably burnt out. Never came off the street. Never had a rest. Uh, and I think uh, we now talk about it more within uh, Victoria Police. It's about work-life balance. It's about not giving everything to the job. And I think for 17 years you did, and at the end of it you think, what, what's left? Uh, and then I had four and a half years out, and then um, someone said, well, why don't you come back? I did, and I was in um, fast track back. But it just gives you a different perspective on life. Yeah. That's the first one. Can, sorry, can we just put that down the back? Thanks. Um, finally, and it would be remiss, of course, because behind every good man is a good woman, as we all know. But you married your childhood sweetheart, Colleen, in the early days. You moved to Melbourne. You had three wonderful kids, Joanne, Matthew, Shay, which obviously your job took its toll on the family. You were missing many important events, lots of Christmases. And I also note that Colleen left you for 24 hours. It may not have even been 24 hours, but um, just explain how that sort of, um, that effect on you, because in the book, you talk about the many Christmases, you're gonna plan this, you're gonna plan that, but to do the dedication that you have given to us Victorians, the Victorian Police Force, over that period of time, somebody suffers, and your family have along that journey. So, how did you go? Looking back over your amazing career, would there been something you would have done differently to try, and they say, the work-life balance, but I don't know how you can do that when you've got the pressure on you and I've read in your book where the first 24, 48 hours of a murder is the time that you've, the leads are hot and you've got to work on it. But is there something that stands out and you think, I should have done that a little bit differently? Looking back now, um, probably not because it is that pressure. Uh, if you're on call and you get a call at two o'clock in the morning, uh, depending on where it is, whether it's in Melbourne, Metropolitan or the country, especially if it's in the country, you pack a bag, and you say, I'll see you later, and you go. You know, I missed my daughter's 18th, I missed the 21st, uh, and the night of her engagement, we had a homicide, I told my boss I couldn't go, he said, you have to go, so I went to the engagement, went home, showered, and then went back to King Street, and, and went on. So I did miss a lot of stuff, and hopefully, uh, over the last couple of years, I'm trying to repay some of those things. Um, finally, Gentlemen, as I've said to you, there are books for sale here. Ron has sold, um, signed those for you, $30 each. Down the road there, $35. But, Ron, can I sincerely thank you on behalf of the Blokes Biggest Lunch because what you have given to the Victorian community is just an amazing. To listen to the, um, the guys sitting there, as they did three years ago, to listen to your things that happened, the Jill Maher case and everything else in your dedicated career, we are so indebted to you, the police force in Victoria, for everything that you've done. And I am so grateful that you've seen. It's an honour for me to have you back in Bendigo for my last lunch. So thank you, Ron. Uh, thanks, thanks, Pete. And it's a pleasure to be here for your uh, last one. Johnny Farnham said he'd never come back, so we might both be back next year. <laughs> Thank you. Please put your hands together for Mr. Ron Engels. Thanks, Ron. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, stand up. Give him a round of applause. Go on. Good on you.